Hey folks, this is the Yaku Cosmopolitan. Welcome back to This Week in Japanese Baseball, a show where I discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly that happened in the world of Japanese baseball over the past week. You can listen on YouTube, Patreon, and Spotify for free. Now, episode one last week was just sort of a trial episode because I wanted to get feedback from you guys, but it seems like most of you guys are in favor of this new format. I do respect if you're not a fan, that's totally fine.、Uh, so, thank you for all the support as always, and I'm excited to keep this series running throughout the 2024 season. But before I begin today, I do want to quickly run through the MPB standings since this show is replacing my MPB recap videos from last year. I think it's only fair if I provide updates on the standings and stat leaders from time to time just to keep everyone up to date、uh, because not everyone has time to follow MPB that closely.、Uh, and I might even bring up my MPB pitcher and hitter power rankings on here once we get into the swing of things. Um, but as of the recording of this, we just finished the opening weekend of MPB action, and then we have finished two games in this next series.、Um, so, you know, teams have only played five games at most right now. But in the Pacific League, we have the Cebu Lions in first place with a record of four and one. Then it's the Soft Bank Hawks and Nippon Ham Fighters at three and two, the r o c k e t t e n Eagles and Lotte Marines at two and three. And then the three time defending pennant winners, the Oryx Buffaloes, are in last at one and four. In the Central League, the Occult Swallows are in first at two, one and one. Then it's the DNA Bay Stars at three and two. The Hiroshima Carp are two and two. The Chunichi Dragons are also two and two, but they have a draw as well. And then the Omiuri Giants and Hanshin Tigers, the two teams I believe will finish at the top of the standings at the end of the year, are at the bottom at two and three so far. And last thing before we start, this video is sponsored by Tone Sport. If you are in need of a high quality yet affordable baseball or softball bag, check out Tone Sport. They have a variety of colors, including dark red, iron gray, radiant pink, and royal blue, as well as different sizes for adults and youth. I don't play baseball anymore, but I tried out a few of the bags myself, and I can attest to their durability and comfort. As they are spacious enough to fit all your various gear and items without feeling too big or too bulky. So, if you or someone you know is a baseball or softball player, definitely check out Tone Sports catalog.、Uh, and with discount code YAKUCOSMO10, you can get 10% off all their products on Amazon. That's discount code YAKUCOSMO10 for 10% off. Links will be in the description below. All right. With all that out of the way, let's get into our three segments the good, the bad, and the ugly. Starting, of course, with the good, because, you know, why not get off on the right foot?、Uh, and there was a lot of good over this past week. Just last night when I'm recording this, Natsuki Takeuchi for the Seibu Lions threw seven shutout innings of one hit ball in his MPV debut. We also saw Koki Kitayama of the Nippon Ham Fighters had a perfect game through six.、Uh, and then, you know, late last week, Ryuki Watarai homered in his first two games of his career, coming off a preseason batting title. So the good point could easily be Watarai, but I already talked about him last episode.、Uh, I could also go with Shota Imanaga. You know, he had an epic MLB debut、uh, with the Cubs, nine Ks in six shutout innings. So you get the point. There's a lot to pick from, but I'm going to switch things up and I'm going with Tatsuya Imai. For my good point this week.、Uh, now, Imai has always been an intriguing player for me because he is a 2016 first round pick,、uh, and the potential with his raw stuff has always been there. Like, he struggled in his first couple of seasons a lot, but honestly, the only reason he was thrown into the rotation at such a young age was because the Lions' rotation in the late 2010s was just so, so shallow that they needed all the arms they could get.、Uh, and looking back, you can tell. He, he just wasn't ready. Like 4.81 ERA in 2018,、uh, got better with a 4.32 ERA in 2019, but then totally bottomed out with a 6.13 ERA in 2020 to go along with a 44 to 52 strikeout to walk ratio in 61 innings. Like walking that many more batters than you strike out is not a good sign at all. But then he bounced back with a 3.30 ERA in 2021. 
And that's when we saw his first real jump in velo as well, uh, going from like 90 to 92 on average up to 93, 95. Uh, in 2022, he got hurt, but then, you know, he had a 241 ERA with the best K rate of his career up at 25% in a small sample. Then 2023 last year was his best overall season uh, to date because he managed to throw 133 innings, which was the third most of his career. Plus, he had a 230 ERA while maintaining that K rate close to 25%. Uh, so the stuff has been legit for the past two to three years now but the problem has always been his command uh, and he's actually never had a walk rate below 10 percent ever in his career which is a problem uh, it's why his FIP and XFIP were significantly higher than his ERA uh, and it's why I ranked him at number 20 on my preseason MPB starting pitcher power rankings like as much as I like his stuff there's just too much volatility there so I had him at number 20 which puts him you know, around the range of guys like Shinosuke Ogasawara, Iori Yamasaki, Taisuke Yamaoka, guys like uh, who, who I think are, are pretty good, but they have flaws, um, which makes them tier three ish pitchers in my eyes. Um, so, you know, maybe they're like one adjustment away from entering that great circle of trust in my top 10, and then maybe two or three adjustments away from entering that elite top five territory. But the reason Imai finds himself as the good point for the week is because his season debut on opening day was utterly dominant. He went seven innings, allowed just two hits, no runs, with 11 strikeouts. But most importantly, he only walked one batter while sitting 96 miles per hour on his fastball, which is about a two mile per hour increase from last year. Uh, and, and it's not just that one start either, because he was showing this velo increase and improved command in spring as well. I just didn't have you know, the data to really back it up. Um, but, you know, he was pumping heat up in the zone, wasn't afraid to go right after hitters. Uh, and the thing that really stood out to me was that he was, uh, he threw 116 pitches and, and almost half of them, 46% actually, were sliders as opposed to just 38% fastballs. Uh, and then the rest were change up curveball. But I, I think he used to be, you know, a bit fastball reliant. So the fact that he, is this comfortable locating the slider now to where he was using it more than his fastball is a very positive trend. Um, and, you know, I can't really say for sure because, you know, I'm not a pitching expert. I don't have all the, the data, but uh, I think his slider is kind of death y You know, the pitch that's been popularized in MLB uh, over the past year or so. It's that death ball to describe a gyro slider that has more velo than a traditional slider or curve. And then it just drops in the zone. Uh, and I think Imai's could be described as something similar because Taisuke Yamaoka of the Buffaloes is a guy that I associate with the death ball or, you know, a vertical slider, whatever you want to call it. And even though Yamaoka is much more over the top in his delivery than Imai, uh, which makes it a bit more of a traditional death ball, I think the pitches do have some similar qualities. And I'm totally fine with Imai being say 80 to 90 percent fastball slider i really am because that would basically make him a two-pitch guy uh but if he's 95 plus on the on the heater all the time and he's not afraid to throw up in the zone and then he's spinning those sliders down and away like you only need two pitches at that point then the changeup he actually throws harder than the slider so it functions as kind of an in-between pitch which can really fool hitters and then the curveball you know, toss it in there three or four times a game to try to steal a strike every now and then. And yeah, I, I would actually love to see him be like 80 to 90% fastball slider, then 10 to 15% changeup, and then like 5% curveball. I also have this custom metric, uh, Pitching Process Quality Plus, PPQ Plus, that combines um, strikeout rate minus walk rate, you know, K minus BB percentage, called strike plus whiff rate, CSW percentage, and then ground ball rate into one number with 100 being league average of course uh and according to you know quick quick calculations that i ran imai registered as a 137 ppq plus in his debut uh, and to put that into context roki sasaki was at 151 for the season last year and then yoshinobu yamamoto was at 120 so you know obviously for imai it's inflated because it's only a single start but at the same time, like not many pitchers out there out there can flash a 137 uh, PPQ plus no matter how small the sample is. Uh, and I do want to credit 
Mr. JF on, on Twitter, on X, for giving him a Blake Snell comp a while ago because, um, you know, I obviously Imai is right-handed, but I think the, the Snell comp is is almost perfect. They have a lot of similarities. Um, they're, they're effectively wild. But this version of Imai we saw is a top 10 pitcher in MPB, like with a top five ceiling. He was just overpowering. Um, and that means Cebu have four legit top 20 pitchers in MPB now in Imai, Kona Takahashi, Kaima Taira, and Chihiro Sumida. And they're all 27 or under as, as well, which is insane. That is really scary. So even if Kona goes to MLB next year, uh, and then Taira, you know, I know he wants to go as well. No problem. Top prospects, Natsuki Takeuchi, who I just mentioned, had in, an incredible debut, uh, which is kind of reminiscent of Sumida two years ago. Um, and then Shinosuke Hada who is one of my top-ranked prospects as well. They, they should be established um, in the next couple of years. So a uh, good point of the week goes to Tatsuya Imai and then, you know, the kind of the Cebu Lions rotation as a whole. But uh, yeah, Imai, not just for his dominance on the mound, but also because, you know, I need to support my fellow long-haired citizens. All right, now the bad point. My bad point for the week, and this actually happened right after my, my first episode dropped, but it's that Rufnet Odor left the Yomiuri Giants. Um, Odor signed with the Yomiuri Giants in January on a one-year deal worth uh, 200 million yen, which is a little over 1.3 million USD. And notably, he was registered as an outfielder. Now, obviously, Odor is is known as an infielder for most of his MLB career um, until that very brief stint at the end in San Diego where he played some outfield, I think. But, you know, it, it was a pretty questionable signing at the beginning to say the least like Odor big swing and miss guy not particularly disciplined at the plate he infamously has like the worst OPS plus ever in MLB history for a 30 home run hitter in a season like back in 2017 with Texas Odor Odor somehow had a 63 OPS plus while hitting 30 bombs which is that's that's honestly crazy to me but uh anyway the Giants hadn't really made a splash in quotation marks this offseason and you know they're already stacked in the infield so they decided to sign Odor to be a corner outfield option um, since they traded away Adam Walker to the Hawks and then they let Lewis Brinson go earlier in the winter Um, and honestly I wasn't expecting Odor Odor to do much at the plate but because he can kind of serve as a utility man between like second third corner outfield um, and then maybe he could be a dangerous bench bat I didn't hate it. Like, again, my expectations were low, but I was like, okay, I I can see them carving out a role for him on this team. Um, But that was until late Tuesday night last week when Odor was told he would be starting the season on the farm in the, you know, minors because he performed terribly in spring, only batted 176 with a sub sub 400 OPS. So uh, he was going to have to earn his way up to the MPB level like everyone else but Odor just straight up told them no like I signed this contract but I don't have any motivation to grind it out on the farm so I want to go back to the U.S. and pursue you know an MLB or a minor league deal and the Giants I'm sure were caught a little off guard by this but they accepted his request to be released and that was that so Odor got released uh, and I think this might be the shortest stint ever for an import player in MPB to start the year like he didn't even make it to opening day um, and obviously, I think this is a pretty lame move by Odor. Like, just because, you know, you have MLB experience doesn't mean you automatically get a free pass for underperforming. And the Giants have pennant aspirations this year, so they can't just afford to, you know, uh, have have a weak sunk cost on their team. Um, and they have plenty of younger, you know, uh, better domestic options in that outfield, as we've already seen in this first week with guys like Masaya Hagio and Shogo Asano. Um, and, and we have seen foreign players abruptly leave their MPB teams in the past. Like, you know, the most recent examples that I can remember would be Justin Smoke in 2020, also for Yomiuri in that pandemic season. Uh, you know, I mean, the Giants just had terrible luck with their imports that year because Eric Thames tore his Achilles I think in in the first game of the season and then smoke backed out um after just a month or two um and smoke was actually performing pretty well but they you know still ended up winning the pennant that year so imagine if they had Thames and smoke they might have actually put up a better fight against soft pink in the japan series instead of getting absolutely wrecked 
They got swept and outscored like 20, 26 to 4 that series. Uh, and in Smoke's case, I, I totally understand why he left. Like the pandemic protocols were just way too much for him and he wanted to go back to see his family. So I don't fault him for that at all, putting family first. Um, but the other, you know, really memorable case of this was uh, Yang Jervis Solarte in 2019 for Han He had this epic debut for, for Han Chin after joining midway through the season. Had a two-homer game, which included a walk-off two-run shot in front of a packed uh, Koshian crowd. You know, that highlight is still playing all the time in Kansai. So he had the highest of highs. But then the league started to figure him out. He got sent down to farm to work on some things. Lost his motivation to play. So, you know, just in a matter of weeks, he, he had the lowest of lows. Um, and, and baseball will do that to you. It is brutal sometimes. But, you know, this Odor situation is much worse because he didn't even make it to opening day. And look, I don't want to just pile on the guy like, you know, it, it should be said that MPB teams also need to do their homework better and make smarter signings. Like, it's important to recognize where a guy's mindset is going into the season. Like, is he actually here because he wants to play in MPB? Is he going to really try his best? Is he grateful for this opportunity? Or is he taking, you know, this as as like just a vacation? Um, he needs to be able to take this seriously and, you know, treat this like the best league in the world, which it is with the obvious exception of uh, MLB. Um, and, and just with the little behind the scenes stuff I heard this winter from, you know, agents and other people, I know at least half a dozen players that, you know, play at a reasonably high level who wanted to have an MPB chance. Um, and I know they would have given 110% day in and day out to perform. Like, I'm not saying they would have been great, but without revealing too much, a couple of them are fairly well-known former MLB players who have been out of the league for a little bit. Um, they have something to prove, and I can almost guarantee they would have been better than Odor in terms of effort at the very least. So um, that's why this is a bad point, because yes, this story is kind of funny in a way, uh, and people are laughing at it, but... It, it's bad because it shows some level of disrespect towards towards MPB and Asian baseball, uh, and, and because there are guys you know like like Hodor taking spots from more deserving players. Because you know, I suppose the Giants can just go out there and bring in an import now, but it's a lot harder to do it once the season starts than during the off season. Um, so. You know, maybe there's some things that we don't know as to why he left, but I feel like this could have all been avoided, you know, if they just made some smarter signings. Um, however, does not affect the Giants negatively on the field, in my opinion. All right, now finally, the ugly. And my ugly point for the week is that MLB has terminated its relationship with international leagues, including the KBO, CPBL, LMB, and of course, MPB. Now, this probably sounds a lot worse than it actually is. Um, you know, like when I first saw this report from, from Nikon Sports and it wasn't really making too many headlines elsewhere because the Shohei Otani press conference about the Ipe scandal was dominating the news that day. But I was thinking, like, why isn't anyone talking about this? You know, it seems like a like pretty big news. And to an extent, it is. But again, it's not as dramatic as it initially sounds, and that's why it's in the ugly category here instead of the bad category. Um, I'm not really sure what to make of this. And just to briefly explain what, what's going on, I'm going to get help from my friend uh, Sean Spraddling, Mr. International Baseball himself. So here he is to explain it. What's up, Yaku Cosmopolitan followers? This is Sean Spradling. So MLB teams have been informed that they are no longer allowed to have partnerships with foreign international major professional baseball league teams. So for example, MLB and NPB, the Mets and the Cebu Lions, the D-backs and the Yokohama Bay Stars, I believe the Rangers and the Nippon Ham Fighters had a partnership. These partnerships are no longer authorized to prohibit uh, and put a stop to pre-negotiation tampering. So you have the posting system that allows international players to make the jump, the leap over to MLB after that service time, after the, they're a certain age, after they've played in those leagues for a certain, certain amount of years, they will then be able to come to MLB. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation that some players and teams have been communicating before that time. Um, there's been some poaching uh, allegations, some tampering. So 
I'm interested to see if this is going to put a stop to it. I'm a little bit skeptical or at least interested to see if this works, um, if the putting a stop to these partnerships will actually prohibit um, the right kind of negotiating or if it's just going to prohibit uh, the trying to skirt around the rules and um, communicate with the players before the, the posting actually happens. We'll see if it actually works, um, but I'm interested to see one way or another. Uh, especially right before the Roki Sasaki saga that we're going to have this next offseason if he actually does get posted. Um, there's already pretty much any MLB team is interested in signing him. There's plenty of scouts already going to see him in Japan this season. So we'll see. I'm interested to see how it goes, but this does not affect the posting system at all. It's just the partnerships that is now terminated. So y'all have a great day. Right. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, I hope that gives everyone a good understanding of the situation at hand. Uh, and I'm going to refer to journalist Jim Allen a lot on this one because he knows the behind the scenes stuff, you know, much better than I do. Um, and he has way more connections. So, you know, I, I take his opinions uh, very seriously. Um, and, you know, he says that this is basically a way for MLB to crack down on tampering without actually cracking down on tampering is, is how I'm interpreting what he's saying. Um, but it, it is significant news that these team partnerships are ending because a, a lot of us thought this was, you know, sort of, you know, data sharing and personnel exchange that was happening between teams like uh, the DNA Bay Stars and Arizona Diamondbacks or Texas Rangers and, and Nippon Ham Fighters. Um, we, we thought this, you know, thing seemed like a great way to connect the baseball world uh, at an international level um, and, and that this could be expanded upon. But instead of expanding on this, they have decided to go in the complete other direction. Uh, now, why exactly did MLB do this, especially so close to opening day? Like, who knows? I thought it has to do with the way Yoshinobu um, Yamamoto's free agency played out. Maybe some MLB executives owners were, were not happy um, and also how the Padres GM AJ Preller just name dropped Roki Sasaki in the middle of the speech a few weeks back um, I'm, I'm actually going to play that clip right now he especially loved to talk about the future and to hear about players like Ethan Salas or guys down the road like a Roki Sasaki and he got really jazzed up thinking about the pursuit of other excellent players to add to the Padre family uh, so yeah there you go like I, I think one could definitely suspect there was some tampering going on with Yamamoto in terms of certain MLB teams, um, like the Dodgers, being in contact with him long before his posting period actually started. Um, and then with Sasaki, you know, given the very mysterious circumstances around his posting request uh, being denied by Lotte this past offseason and then his contract holdout over, um, for, for a while, it would certainly be a concern if teams like the Padres and also the Dodgers um, we're already trying to recruit him. Um, and, you know, th there is absolutely no way AJ Preller just casually said he wants to add Roki to the Padres family. Like, you are not supposed to say that. Say the quiet part out loud, dude. Um, but anyway, according to Jeff Passan, who we all trust, the, the only thing these, ru these rules really do affect is uh, these legitimate partnerships between MLB and international clubs where teams would send coaches and all their personnel uh, to one another for data and information exchange. Sometimes players, um, you know, would get new training perspectives as well. So this was a pretty good ecosystem, in my opinion. Um, and like I said, I, I thought it would only keep expanding from here, but now special MLB permission will be required uh, if you want to do this and there's all these extra unnecessary steps you you, you have to do for even small scale things um so maybe even legends like hideki matsui or ichiro who like to guest coach in japan sometimes like is it is, is this going to affect them uh is this going to affect japanese mlb players interacting with their former M mpb teams like you darvish who's still very close to the fighters we don't know and i think that uh, MLB and MPB both need to address this pre-negotiation tampering problem for sure. Uh, there are some very shady things going on right now. And there was that case of, once again, the Dodgers getting in trouble during the 2017 WBC when they asked Adrian Gonzalez to uh, give Shohei Otani a, a gift as a goodwill gesture um, to try to recruit him back then. Um, and then, you know, now we have Bob Nightingale saying that rookie to the Dodgers 
this upcoming offseason is already a done deal. So, you know, if things get out of hand, you're going to have a lot more MLB tre- MLB teams trying to unfairly approach young international players before they're even in a position to be posted. And that's against the rules. So even if those rules are, are never enforced, um, I, I do think the posting system is going to need to be completely overhauled in, in wake of the Roki Sasaki situation in the coming years. Um, but yeah, this sort of seems like a bit of a knee-jerk reaction of sorts by MLB to prevent potential tampering between smaller clubs. Like, for instance, you know, just for the sake of argument, we know DNA in Arizona have or, or had a relationship. So let's say Shugomaki of the Bay Stars who wants to go to MLB. Maybe the D-backs would have an inside track on eventually signing him um, if their people were establishing a close relationship with him over the years. That's just one possible example of how this sort of uh, partnership access could be viewed as pre-negotiation tampering from MLB's perspective. So so I understand it, but I'm not sure this is going to affect any of the big, biggest culprits. Like, it should not come, come as a surprise that your New York Yankees and LA Dodgers of the world can easily cheat the system. These are teams that have an infinite number of resources, and they can send Pacific Rim scouts to you know, breathe the down everyone's neck and send executives to probably establish contact with international players long before they're really supposed to. Um, so I'm putting this as an ugly point just because we have to wait and see. You know, we have to wait and see what the long-term implications of this are. I don't think any of us can definitively um, say how big of an impact, either positive or negative, this is going to have. I mean, maybe somebody with uh, a, a bit more insight can, but I definitely can't. So... Um, I would say this decision by itself in isolation is probably not a good thing. But it could become a good thing if this is only the beginning of this so-called tampering crackdown. Uh, and, and maybe the club partnerships are just, you know, a necessary sacrifice. But as Jim Allen puts it, this is essentially a temporary band-aid for the situation because, quote, the MLB rule is not going to solve a damn thing, but it is going to complicate the hell out of everything. Uh, end quote. So that's what Jim Allen thinks, and I certainly find it interesting that MLB chose this timing to address it, um, but let's keep a close eye on how this develops. But that does it for episode two of This Week in Japanese Baseball. Thank you all for listening. Make sure to follow me on X uh, at Yaku Cosmo. Subscribe to me on YouTube and support me on Patreon over at Baseball Cosmo. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe for more MPB content in English.